Once again, ladies and gentlemen, to the Adventures in History Land YouTube channel. Today we have a returning guest. Yes, that rare thing. Someone came back to talk to me about something. Okay. And, and, uh, and of course, uh, for those of you who don't know, rest assured that you may have manner problems, but Chaz is not one of them. Oh. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah. <laughs> Get off. <laughs> it's a, the puns have started. Yes, Chaz Mena, that, uh from the episode for, about curiosity um, is back with us. And today he's talking about a very history land sort of thing. And I'm saying this because I, I dot around a lot of places. I am very unfocused in terms of my historical interests. And I love the fact that I first got in contact with you about the Spanish and the American Revolution, and then you are this huge World War II enthusiast, and, but we're, today we're talking about, about, about Custer and the Little Bighorn. <laughs> Chaz, great to talk to you again. <laughs> we're all over the map, you and I. I mean, you, you've just been to a wonderful series of podcasts with History Hack from my door. I, I, all of them. It was wonderful, mm -hmm. and and I really enjoyed your last pod on the British Army. Yes, that yeah. was a lot of fun to do. Yeah. So, Chaz, first of all, maybe the first question is: I mean, first, I, I'm going to make this clear. I'm very fascinated by this period of American history. I, I think that it's a. I mean, it's 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 a very rich subject. It's deeply embedded in the 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 story of the United States. You know. It, at a certain time, kids played cowboys and Indians, and at the heart of the legends of this is the legend of, of George Armstrong Custer and the last stand of the Little Bighorn. Obviously, he has a much longer story going back into the Civil Wars and stuff. Civil War? Civil Wars? What are we in England now? Uh, the Civil War? <laughs> oh, we just opened a huge can of worms. The American Revolution is a Civil War. But we should, we should talk about the terms that people use, because that's an interesting... Um, topic in itself. You're talking about one side will call something a massacre and a slaughter, whereas the other side says, well, it's just a battle, guys. We won. <laughs> Why is that a massacre? Uh, whereas, in fact, there are actual massacres where people, where like troops go in and, and kill, or, kill like whole civilian populations and vice versa and stuff like that. So there's a whole terminology discussion to be, to be had. Um, the Indians committed massacres. The, yeah. the Americans, uh, especially after after the Civil War, gentrified, mm -hmm. right? Opened space up, or mollified, or brought peace to. All of these innocuous sounding phrases, uh, which you can argue, uh, in some of the smaller unit actions, uh, and actually some of the larger ones, it was the stuff of Einzelbrücken, you know. Uh -huh. uh, uh, yeah, yeah. genocide. Um, yeah, absolutely. So this is this is why when you when people talk about casually this period of 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 the Indian Wars, distinctions really need to be reaffirmed as to what is a battle and what is a massacre. And I of the opinion that Dade's fight is a battle. You know, the Seminoles ambushed successfully a, a federal column. And the Battle of the Little Bighorn is a battle. 
was called a massacre at the time. It's a battle. Come on, who are you kidding? Um, but so, even, even today, if you go to the Laramie uh, reservations, if you go to um, Sioux reservations, um, you know, it's it's actually it's it's where we stood up. It's it's their yeah. What it's their uh, Alamo. It's their uh, the, the, Alamo. I, it's their. I, I, Give me for the reference, but it's there, Lexington and Concord and all well, the rest. Well, yeah, of them. exactly. I mean, I, I like, yeah. I, I like the idea of turning the last stand on its head, because I liked what uh, what Joe Medicine Crow said about uh, mm -hmm. the little big one, when he said that a lot of people think that it's Custer's last stand. It's actually Sitting Bull's last last stand. Well, I, I would argue yes, and, and that's why the like. You know, I'm working on this book that I that the working title is Two Stood, because in fact two did stand. And two have stood from the first, and two continue to stand. Only recently we had the Black Hills fiasco where, where you had some MAGA types go out there and purposely uh, insult the, the you know, the Black Hills is like Jerusalem mm -hmm. Christians. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, it's the suit. Uh literally, it's it's their um, their mirth, their their birth myth, their 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 um, their Valhalla, certainly, mm -hmm. you know the uh, their the names of their of their hallowed you know, uh, uh, figures and, and historical uh, examples for that culture are engraved into the stone. I mean, you know, it's 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 the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was full of uh, alcohol drinking, uh, a rather shall we say, um, I don't want to get political, but but certainly you'd have to admit that these were people who were a bit too radical in their politics, yeah. And uh, and it was kind of like, a, well, it was, there are love fests and then there are hate fests. And I'll leave it up to the audience to decide which one they were. But they had no business being there. They they actually were not granted permission by the tribal consuls authority. But yet in they went because ultimate domain is the United States. And that is the exact same argument that the federal government made to the Sioux people, even though it, uh, in, a, in, a, in a war predating uh, the, the Sioux uprising in the 1870s, there was a Red Stick War, and the Sioux actually defeated the American Army. And Red Cloud's War, yeah. One of the things granted to them were the Black Hills, recognized mm -hmm. by both parties as sacrosanct, and uh, a, a, a huge huge swath of land called the Sioux Reservation. And just to give listeners an idea, uh, we're talking about over 250,000 square miles, all right, which is equivalent to England, Wales, and almost all of Scotland put together. So the British, basically, uh, just below, could fit in this reservation. Uh, mm -hmm. It's huge. It's mammoth. And, um, but there you are, ultimate domain. Uh, gold was found uh, in along the creeks, uh, the small kind of rippling creeks along the Black, uh, Black Hills, and it indented in some of the rock and some of the soil, it found nuggets. And it's, uh, and, you know, in an economy that was suffering, the, the, the Great Depression before the 1930s was the Depression of the 1870s, you know, where you had very little money. It was a, a, a gold standard, you know, backed, Currency, there wasn't enough gold bought by the federal government. What was there was 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 sold, you know, during the Civil War, you know, in order to pay for the Civil War. You had uh, mass unemployment. You had the Great Wall Street Scare. Uh, if there were, I believe, four out of five Americans were unemployed or were partially employed at that time. You know, we're talking about a, a population of about by then, by the 1870s, about 25 million, nigh on. So you know, this is a crisis. You know, and you've just yeah. fought a war. You really can't have a social uprising. And you have a lot of immigrants from the 1840s from Central Europe who have begun to understand what Marxism is. There's, there's, there's that beginning idea of, of, of class warfare, warfare, excuse me, which doesn't bear fruit uh, in the United States as it does in Europe. But it certainly, it's, it's beginning to show its head in people, mm -hmm. papers and in Chicago and uh, workers newspapers, Chicago and New York, in places like St. Louis, which is you know on the margin of the frontier, mm -hmm. 
are, are beginning to be read. So what's, I don't know if there was a clear present threat yet. It certainly was by the 1890s and, and the turn of the century, but something had to get done. And then all of a sudden, here's this huge mammoth piece of land about the size of Rhode Island that's, that's full of gold to their estimates. Well, their estimates fell short. To date, the Black Hill mines are the most lucrative mines in American history, including Canada. I should say in North American history. Crazy. And, yeah, even more than the than the uh, than than the veins of Zacatapa and um, I'm sorry, Zapateca in, in in Mexico. Like for hundreds of years, forgive me. Sorry. Mm. In fact, there you could still. If you want to, you could still go in there and find more, more, more veins. But I mean, there's, there's, there's some the Sioux have been given some due and and hands off. Mm -hmm. But time, you know, it, ultimate domain was was cited and it's ours, and that's, mm -hmm. it. that's mm -hmm. it. So that to a certain extent, that's what happened in that mega, mm -hmm. um, all the way around to explain how offensive mm -hmm. that uh, get together was, Codeon was. Um, <laughs> And I have a right to be offended. I'm an American, but can you mm -hmm. imagine Native American? Oh, yeah. Because it's, it's a whole different thing uh, to be offended politically. And, and the, 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 the deal with the Black Hills, like you're saying, is a completely different level of, uh, of offense to have that violated. Um, and it's interesting that this is, this is at the core of, of why the Great Sioux Uprising happened. Like you say, you had... I believe the Lakota um, under Red Cloud might also claim the only nation to dictate a peace treaty with yeah. the United States. The Fort Laramie uh, uh, Treaty, and, and it, it, was, it was legal to the point of uh, 10, 20 generations or something like that. <laughs> like that um and it was phrased in a very figurative way for uh, the native americans to to grasp and and by that just just in what i've said just in what i've said even getting two peoples of such vastly different cultural contexts where our language is nowhere near what the what the sioux language is the lakota language is uh -huh. which actually alphabetized after the, ba uh, the Battle of the Little Bighorn between the 1890s and that, and that era, and that progressive, was seen as a progressive movement, give them their own language and they'll be like us and they'll be writing literature and they'll be, with the, you know, uh, the Lakota, Lakota will have their Henry James's, right? And mm -hmm. that's sort of, uh, uh, Mary Louise Alcott's. Um, my, but my point is that we've got two different ways of looking at the world. One is purely materialistic, especially in, you know, in the West at that time, which was teleological, progressive, uh, the way to, the way to exploit the land is to cut it down, break it down, use it for fuel, use it for uh, caloric intake, uh, uh, secure more caloric intake by fertilizing the land, cutting, you know, uh, uh, Arab making arable land, burning forests for fertilizer, killing the buffalo so the railroads can come in, with the foodstuffs that we need so that they could take out what we, what we harvest. That sort of thing is consumptive materials. The other side is the polar opposite. It's sustainability. It's not that over there and me. In other words, it doesn't divide us uh, from the glory of, of nature. Of, uh, it doesn't it, it says that it, it, it's it's not it doesn't it's not subjective, is it? It's no. it's it's uniform. I am part of this. What grows out of this land is in my body, quite literally, because I've drank from this this stream and I've um, I've eaten on the soil and I walk on the soil and and my grandfather's buried there and he's part of what grows. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. it was a, um, sustainability versus a consumptive society mm -hmm. that that impairs that that infuses language. You know, the English sentence even is <laughs> one does something to something else, nonverbal object. That didn't exist in the, in the, in the Indian sentence, if you would. It's, mm -hmm. it's a series of subjects, 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 and then this happened. So it's mm -hmm. even forensically. So 
and, and you can look at their calendars. They didn't have calendars. They had glyphs mm -hmm. round and round and round. And every year was recorded by one main event. And it mm -hmm. could be something as, as mundane as the day uh, Red Cloud bought his cow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, or the day that Sitting Bull kicked his wife out of the tent, you know, yeah. uh, uh, or, or indeed the day that, that the Sioux, the Arapaho, and what was left of the Cheyenne defeated the blue fellas. Mm -hmm. The long knives, long hair, yeah. the washi chews, I think, is the, the word. Is the word, and they defeated the Sun of the Morning Star, which, is, which attributes to the massacre. Mm -hmm. uh, that the Seventh Cavalry um, oversaw, indeed, in, yeah, in the war against the Cheyenne in 1868, which put him in amongst you know historically the best Indian fighter or Indian fighter. Yeah, yeah, let's 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 briefly talk about George Custer's way of war and uh, fighting fighting the the uh, in quotes hostile tribes. Um, my take on it is that uh, it, it starts at uh, Washita, and he. It's it's been. It, I mean, it's it's an old. It's actually it's quite an old tactic when dealing with tribes who don't who don't want to to buckle down is to attack their homes, burn their homes, and take away from them the ability to fight. There's a high level concept of that even in European warfare. And also in this level of warfare, and Caster, we could even even reference it in Caesar's Gallic Wars. Yeah, exactly. It's very old Cast idea. Yeah, Fly. exactly. Uh, uh, so, Fly is one of the indigenous and and, and Cortes famously did so. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. He did it very successfully and with much more intelligence than Caster. <laughs> but um, probably a better leader too. But, but yeah, uh, probably. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the long difference. Long Different subject. So, uh, uh, but my also my other thing about Custer is that I I don't think he understood actually how to f as in uh, actively fight um, the Sioux at Washita. Well, he yeah. he was able he 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 went in. He attacked a camp and then got out, and a bunch of his guys actually got left behind and killed. He got out before he had to do any fighting, active fighting, and then he and then he sort of took this 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 success, and he said, "Well, this is just how you fight these people now. I can do this against anybody because he was a, a very aggressive commander and he knew the cavalry way of warfare. Always attack, even if you're outnumbered." Well, those those are really good points. There there were some novel things about that in mm -hmm. that uh, you, one didn't fight in a winter campaign, especially when. Mm -hmm. This is true. Yeah. Snow flew to such an extent that I believe at Washita there may have been upwards of fifty centimeters. It was really bad. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So the, the the that and that's that's actually good military planning. Yeah. Uh, and and he when he comes out in the those are, these are Kansas wars. These are the Southern Plains, right? The uh, the Missouri or Missouri, depending on what part of Missouri you're in. Um, cuts the, the south, the southern plains, and the northern plains. So this is the great war of the southern plains taking place in Kansas and northern Texas. Um, he actually uh, he actually trains his men really, really well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he, he makes them go out on, on scouts uh, without, you know, any clear military uh, goal except just hardening them up. You know, you're dealing with an army that was, we can talk about the, the, the cavalry at that time, which was, you know, the ghost of the really shadow of what it was during the Civil War. But he hardens these men up, and, uh, and that's where the myth of the 7th Cavalry comes to be. Um, what he does at Washita is on purposely, on purpose, avoid a fight. It was about going in and, uh, into Black Kettle and, mm -hmm. and knowing knowing that the young men in winter go out before the sun rises to hunt. Mm -hmm. the creatures come out in the little light that there is in the winter to try to, you know, to, to feed themselves, to eat, and that includes uh, and fauna and, um, and, and smaller animals. Um, and then he goes in there quite purposely, knowing that he's shooing 
the main force of, of Braves that'll defend them. And what's his purpose? His purpose is to claim their, their women and children, uh-huh. force the men to put down their arms. Uh-huh. And that was a viable way that had worked yeah. uh, in certain places. So, I mean, there is a precedent with him. Oh, yes, definitely. Right. What he did not count upon is what happens later on, which was not only a, a, tac- a new tactics introduced by uh, Crazy Horse and the other, uh, some other, in the Kanju, um, yeah. uh, generals or, or chiefs, and the fact that 10 years later, he was going to be in the middle of a people's war. Uh-huh. By that, I mean that the resources of the entire tribe was about surviving to fight another day. That uh-huh. was by 1870, and that's what he means in the Battle of the Little Bighorn, and those, well, those, those, those thrusts, uh, uh, they're, really, they're really copying Confederate cavalry tax, tactics, as you know, you're a big Civil War reader. You know, yeah. go, go really deep, Don't, doesn't matter how many forces you're going against, you just pierce right through and involve no run away. I mean, that, that's what they're counting on. So. And- this is his. This is Custer's thing. He understands that psychology that if I attack aggressively, but I have the initiative. He borrows from Jeb Stewart, though, doesn't he? Oh, he, yeah. He and goes deep. Yeah. And it's, and nobody can hit a moving target, right? It's that idea of. Mm-hmm. But what you had was a core of cavalry that was actually quite good. So, but the idea is, oh, it's very simple. These children tend to run away, so, so let's create a pocket where they could run into us, right? So you've got three uh, columns coming in. From the northeast, you, from Fort Lincoln, you get uh, Terry and Custer, the Terry and Custer force, right? And from the northwest, you get the Gibbon force, which was infantry, right? And, and the, the much larger force coming from the south by southwest was Crooks, which was infantry and cavalry. Uh, Infantry supporting, or cavalry supporting infantry. Uh-huh. And they're soundly defeated at the Rosebud uh-huh. River. Uh, and at the head of that, the main uh, effort was generalized, to use that term, by Crazy Horse. Uh-huh. Crazy Horse survives that, the wars in Cheyenne. Even though he's, he's a ball of Sioux, he survives uh, um, those, those wars and he begins. He becomes adept. He learns how to fight the Union cavalry, um, and he uses that sense of mobility. He uses the idea of keeping a reserve force ready. So you, you fight them to a stop, and then you throw in another wave. These are European ideas, you know, uh, 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 concerted uh, fire support. You know, one side then the other sometimes in tandem, you begin to, to see, and let's be frank, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not British Army. <laughs> I mean, you, you don't have that same concerted effort or, or um, your ability to stay on, on, on the field as long as, say, mm-hmm. but they don't want to, mm-hmm. they don't want to. They're, they're, they're tied to their idea of mobility. Keep them moving. We're not yeah. gonna move. We're gonna, we're gonna make you move. You're gonna keep, I'm going to keep you moving, and then I'm, I'm going to, like, like we do with Buffalo, you know, it's, it's, it's a great reaction to what the Union was expecting them to do, mm-hmm. um, and Crook is so demoralized that he just walks away from the campaign. So, yeah, it's a, no, <laughs> none of this. Goes back to Fort Fetterman to the south, you know, uh, and, and, and of course the idea was that so these three columns come in, and Custer was to do a, with his 7th Regiment, he was to do a, because it, I, should, I should preface this, that Marcus Reno, who later becomes famous at, on Reno's Last Stand, or infamous, I should say, encountered uh, Indian tracks, and actually ha- has some kind of firefight with some, with some of them, and, and sees their tracks, and, they're, and he realizes that they're going into the Little Bighorn Valley. Now, what would you see in the track? You would see a travaux, which was like, uh, yeah. you know, it was a triangle. Three, three-pronged, arrow trails. And... It, no wheels. It was just like, it was 
tree logs put together creating a an isosceles triangle and you just throw weight on top of your drag. Um, so the the tracks, the horses, hopes, and travaux, uh, look to be, you know, like a, 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 a large horse. So he comes back rather than attack them. He knew that they were half a day's uh, right away, but he comes back to inform Terry, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the man the Custer force. Custer thinks that he's a coward. Because how do you not attack them? Again, he's stuck in that mentality. Yeah. Of, of, of attack and, and adjust, attack and adjust, attack and adjust, so we can all go home quicker. I mean, it's, it's very interesting. And, to, and even in the paper, he calls, he all but calls him coward. So then uh, Terry sends the 7th Regiment south in a, in a, in a wide arc move, uh, mm -hmm. I guess, to make contact with Crook's column that is supposedly at the Rosebud. But it is not at the rose <laughs> you know. Uh, and it, after a after a, a grueling march, uh, the, the, on the eve of a battle, when people are beginning to bunk down and eat their their their, their dried beef and and mm -hmm. what have you, yeah, yeah. Um, he orders a march. He orders a, a march. He orders a march across and into the valley to, to follow those tracks. Now, mm -hmm. what he saw were tracks of maybe equivalent to maybe 2,000. What he didn't know that by then, thousands of others had congregated on the valley to mm -hmm. hunt, live as they do in the summer. And that's his big surprise. You know? yeah. um, because after, after Rosebud, what happens is that the confederation of tribes that have gathered together to fight there, but they basically... It was actually, said it actually before. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, no. absolutely. Um, uh, it was said that the camp that they were working from to go to a fight at the Rosebud, there were almost more horses than people, and there was no grazing left basically. So they had to move, and it was known that there were herds of antelope and stuff up in the what they called the greasy grass, which is the river. It's still called Battle of Greasy Grass from the sea. Uh, and so they went there, where they could find more grazing. So as cast is moving, all these tribal pockets are also moving, congregating on this point. And it's also sitting Bull's kind of rhetoric at work here. He's saying, I'm going to have a council here. I want people to come in. I want to tell I want to hear whether you're going to stand and fight with me for the old ways or whether you're just going to go and be a, a reservation Indian. Right. We haven't spoken about Sitting Bull. He, by then, he is, he's no longer a mil. of course, he outgenerals, for lack of a better word. He's, he's no longer a military figure. He's a spiritual mm -hmm. head. And he's had a, um, a, a, um, a Sioux ritual called the, the Sun Dance, which is where there's self-mortification involved. You spend three days without food and drink, and you get visions, and those visions are interpreted. And what he interpreted was that... In the middle of Sundance, when he's about to pass out, indeed he does, he gets an image of thousands of blue-jacketed uh, soldiers are falling from the mm -hmm. sky and dying on the, on the valley floor, dismembered. Mm -hmm. um, and that's his vision that whomever attacks us will, will receive that fate. The Battle of the Rosebud happens. And they and that was that predated the. I think it was a week before Rosebud, so it would be when what would it be the end of May, beginning of June. So, actually, the first week of June. So, um, people are saying, ah, the, the vision came true, but he kept saying, no, no, no. I, I didn't see them falling. I saw them falling where we are right now, because I, I, I was he. You know, I saw them falling in this valley. Uh -huh. um, Custer comes in the middle of their of their uh, fets of their of their their dancing for their victory dances and their victory celebrations, you know, mm -hmm. um, because he has no idea. Mm. It's um, a surprise for both sides. I mean, to give him credit, the the, the Cheyenne, the Lakota, Oglala, Papa, you know, all of these people, they they weren't expecting him to suddenly come and attack right. them, right? Right, the Lakota, and, and they had a cosmopolitanism, because the, the Lakota means people of the plains. All of these it become a place of exile for Cheyennes, 
from the erstwhile wars of the mm-hmm. late he's come to live with them. Famously crazy horse, right? Arapaho come to live with them. Um, and that becomes a cosmopolitanism where the Lakota language is, becomes the, the lingua franca. And they're, they're fully accepted. The Sioux fully accepted refugees in the Cheyenne. Yeah. Uh, and, but that, that's important to state because that, that cosmo, for lack of a better word, cosmopolitanism, that, that, well, humane vision of what it was to be Sioux is, is important because the Sioux were highly tribal. The Sioux originated from the southern banks of, of Lake Michigan. They were pushed out, right? Uh, by other warring Indians that came over from, the, from, from Andrew Jackson's policy of repopulation. You had the Cherokees coming from very highly specialized warring tribes. And the Sioux develop a whole new economy. At the same time, they're in the Great Plains, and all of these Spanish horses from Mexico are there. They learn mm-hmm. how to explore. They, 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 new, image, new, new myths of white buffalo women come into be, where... where where in, it, just when they're dying because they can't collect food, they don't know where they are, what they can do. White buffalo woman shows up and tells them the way to live with, with by the buffalo. Mm-hmm. Right, of course, become very adept. And importantly, they 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 push out the other Indian tribes, mm-hmm. and and those Indian tribes later become um, specifically the <sighs> crow. Uh, yes. the, com- the crow. Very, the com- very important there, very the crow. The one, they're the leading scouts. They're the eyes of the Union Fort, I just call it Union, but the federal forces. Uh, and it is the crow scouts who say, we have been fighting these people. You are underestimating them. Mm-hmm. They're capable of having camps as, as uh, with teepees. You can't count them. With, with teepees like a forest. Mm-hmm. There are more people here. Oh, nonsense, nonsense. They can't, they can't police, uh, a, they're, they're savages, they're, they're Neolithic people, they, they, so they can't police a 10,000 member camp. Um, and boy, were they wrong. And, but that's, that's where my interest lies, you see, yeah. it is, is the ability of these indigenous uh, peoples, plural, to think of themselves as and Pluri was full of them, and and create and, and modify, create, learn from, legislate, uh-huh. uh, um, um, naturalize. Uh-huh. They're not warring heathens. They can find a way to share the resources of this place, yeah. and let to police to to um, and to live in 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 peace and to create a nation of other nations, yeah. right? Yeah, it's like it's like one of one of Sitting Bull's um, descendants. I think his name is uh, his last name is Lapointe or something like that. He he described the camp at, at uh, Greasy Grass as um, not. It wasn't like it wasn't like you see, read all in the history books and stuff. His grand uncles told him this that it's a collection of parts of larger tribes who are refugees and uh, and things like that. It's it's not as it's it's much more it's it's much more complicated than just big sort of blocks That's of right. allied tribes. That's right. That's right. I mean, it's it's remember Andrew Jackson. Uh, I yeah, he was you're familiar with the Trail of Tears thing. Mm. Um, you know, the, the, basically, you know, the American Republic was populated enough where we needed to move west of the, of the, of the uh, Appalachians and the Ozarks and up to the Mississippi River, which was now mm-hmm. our river, and push the, the heathen Indians on west of the Mississippi, right? Because they thought, just like the slavers did in the 18th century, that because these people in Africa all had black skins, ah, they're just, they're all the same. But Africa was comprised and is comprised yeah. of vastly different people. It's like going to the Balkans and p- grabbing a Serb and a Bosnian and, and, a, and a, an Albanian and a Macedonian and a Greek and put them all together. Ah, there's a bunch of Balkans. I mean, it's, it's absurd. You know, mm-hmm. there's different languages. They, they dress differently. They had different cultural uh, uh, taboos. They ate different foods. They, you know, I mean, you know, and, and that's what happened. Mm-hmm. 
for the trail of tears. But but that American point of view of blanching, pardon the pun, blanching history in such a way that mm -hmm. people go over here, um, that idea stays really ingrained mm -hmm. in American culture, and I think in you know in, 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 infuses or or affects military tactics and military policy yeah. and policing policy, administrative policies um, it, 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 after the Civil War, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, one, meet one and even, you, you meet them all, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think so. I think so. And certainly Castro didn't really care about the intricacies of actually, you know, effectively uh, dealing, because he, he didn't know what he was facing. He yeah. said, he, he heard there was a camp somewhere. I, I would venture to say he didn't want to know. Because he I don't was, think, no, uh, he didn't care. It was like a willful dispensation of reality. Um, so, battle time then. Let's get to the let's get to the the meat of this this last stand stuff. So, from all of the accounts I've ever read from the from from the uh, confederated tribes' point of view, um, they weren't expecting an attack. Whether or not Sitting Bull knew their something was going to happen, their whole idea, and this goes back to Crooks, we're going to live our way, and whoever comes to, you know. And this is the belief system. This yeah. is the orthodoxy. This is the orthodoxy, um, and by I mean quite literal, quite literally religious orthodoxy that the great, uh, 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 great father uh, will protect us if we live our own way. Uh, if anybody comes to harm us, we will fight back. But we will live our way. It's it's kind of a. I, I'm not a particularly a religious person. I'm not orthodox uh, in, in mm -hmm. anything. In my, in, in, in my humanism, I guess maybe I'm orthodox. Um, oh, that's anti-orthodox. What I'm trying to say, <laughs> this isn't about me. What I'm trying to say is, I could see why that was their only choice. If we're fighting for our own way of living, how best to fight, but by living, uh -huh. you know? So we're gonna fight a defensive war. Anybody comes here, they're going to get it. This is our land. This is our land. No. That's actually literally the words that I think his name was Iron Hawk said mm -hmm. about Castor. Uh, and it's in it's in the book Black Elk Speaks, um, and he and he says, mm, "Yeah, it's great." And he said something like, uh, "I didn't feel like I didn't feel sorry or bad about it because they they came to get it and we gave it to them. Gave it to them. They wouldn't hear. They wouldn't listen. And in fact, I know I'm jumping ahead." Uh, uh, it, it said, and, and we should talk a little bit, of, we're not running out of time, um, about all the testimonies, because sometimes they contradict, uh, but uh, Buffalo Catwoman, I believe is her name, she, was, she, she fought in the battle, and she writes down that the women after battle came with knitting needles and, 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 and impaled them, I don't know if that's the right word, uh, but, but stuck uh, them in Custer's ears because he would not listen. I mean, so, the image yeah. of that. It's, it's actually, it's, 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 it's very powerful and it's also very interesting about Custer and the way he died from that perspective as well. And again, we're jumping ahead, but presumably everybody knows that Custer doesn't get out alive. No. But <laughs> we'll tell you how, we'll, tell, we'll give you the basics. <laughs> we'll give you the basics of how everything goes wrong. So they had no eyes on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, this is a very, this is a deep valley. Uh, they're coming in from 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 uh, even a lower sea level. They're going slowly up, um, and though and he divides his forces in order to 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 have cognizance of where he's going into. So, in order to gain cognizance of where he's of what he's entering into, right, uh, into the valley. He sends Benteen with uh, three other companies, uh, I forget the letters, but he sends them up to the high hills, up to these buttes, right? Um, now, the, the Indian uh, uh, camp, <clears throat> the Sioux camp, um, and these are TVs, you know, in, in the, the, the hyper-Indian view, uh -huh. uh, these are straight up, Cow high, the buffalo high TVs. He could barely make something out from the first view. So he goes down to the second view. He goes down, up, 
up, up atop the second butte. And again, a butte is a flat grassland that's kind of jutting up like a table, if you would, um, atop a dry riverbed. <clears throat> Just a hewn out part of, 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 the, of the craggy uh, terrain. Um, and he, he, he thinks he sees some smoke, but he can't really tell. And he goes back down, and when he goes up to the third, he can make out just the beginnings of the southern end of the Indian camp. So by then, by then, the two uh, the two thirds of the regiment are on either side of the uh, Bighorn River. I'm sorry, the Little Bighorn River, and Marcus Reno is on the uh, major. Marcus Reno is on the western bank, and up on the eastern bank, which is slightly higher, is Custer with his four companies, right? So you've got three and three is six, four left. Remember, there were 10 companies. Those four with Custer. The idea is to keep the mobile, they're all highly mobile, but to keep the, the punch moving. Mm -hmm. So the idea was, just as you described earlier, was to, uh, first of all, Benteen to send words to let us know how many are there, then join Reno as a reserve. Reno was to attack these three companies, by then he was counting on Benteen coming down, acting as a reserve force, and he would go up and envelop what he thought was maybe a quarter size Indian village of what it actually was. Yeah. Um, and he kept, and, and then so when Marcus Reno attacks and forms a firing line, which was spelled the death knell for yeah. the regiment, if he, sh he should have continued to go into the village, but he was intimidated by the size of a village. Yeah. It was a sized town in Ohio. You know, you have 10,000, 12,000. Exactly. And, and unlike in other, and I, uh, unlike Rosita, the, 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 the men were there, the warriors were there. In the winter, sure, they go out hunting. In the summer, the young men go out to the pony herds to, watch the, to water and graze the horses and stuff like that. And all of the young men remember when they were telling their stories later on, I was sent out to watch the pony herd. And then we went and had splashed all, around in the river. All, all the boys, when they're old men in the 20s and 30s, yeah. they had the same. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And Custer just underestimated the response, the, the, far, the, the speed of the response. Reno came down onto the... The, the, the floodplain bit where the grass was, where the pony herd was, and he was probably going to go up. He probably would have continued into the camp. Yes, he would. But well, that was then, then, told yeah, to, you know. then, then like a, a wasp's nest, you know, fighters emerge, leap on their horses. They're putting all sorts of decorations on their hair as the attack is happening. Indeed. But he thought he was buying time because he got intimidated. Yeah. Side. He wasn't expecting. So it's a combination of both things. By then, he figured after an hour of or yeah. minute, custom I mean, from this. You know. it's, it's, it's kind of good military doctrine from the point of view of the 19th century, of his, of his mind, okay? Cavalry doctrine, actually, you do dismount and form a firing line. It's actually what they're trained to do. Yeah, no, I know they are, but they and, do five, and then one guy, one, one soldier yeah. pulled the other four, and then the four yeah. just come. So when when he hits opposition, he thinks, because he's not Custer, and he doesn't think charge, he thinks, okay, I'll stop and fire, we have better weapons, we can fire, we can keep these guys at bay, like you say, resist. Uh, it's too big to attack, so I'll just stand out here and and do that. Well, that's what he, that's how he defends himself. And yeah. I think that may be one of the reasons why he becomes a bot top, uh, but what he does later when they retired, and I'm jumping the gun, what he does later in the battle is just, he was also, uh, by all, by all uh, surviving accounts, he was drunk. <laughs> Possibly so, yeah. Uh, I, could, I could mention three or four he, off the top of my head that saw him taking nips. And yeah. so by the time that firing line is overwhelmed and about to be flanked, what does yeah. he do? He retires his little cops. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I mean, think about that. The, the, he saw the high ground, which later becomes Reno Hill. So rather than go up to the high hill, which was he, about a uh, quarter of a mile away, he goes into this wooden copse yeah. of elm trees and a box elm, <clears throat> like a child does. Yeah. When, if, God forbid, breaks into your house, you, you put the blanket over your head. 
I mean, yeah. that's it's tantamount to that. He, if he plays the situation, you're going to be yeah. surrounded, you're going to be smoked out, you're going to be yeah. mad. When he gets, yeah, he, yeah. Yeah. he he handles the situation terribly, yeah. is what he does. I mean, yeah. to retreat in the face of of mounted warriors, just awful. <laughs> Half of them were mounted. Half of them were on foot because the, yeah. the children, the boys, were coming in with ponies for them to yeah. ride. So this, this he great. Had time. He had time. Yeah. Had he acted to go across the the stream bed at that moment, which yeah. is not as is shallower than you yeah. know, the north, he could have reached what is now Reno Hill. Yeah. Uh, that has a gradient, a small gradient. It's got one of the highest gradients. I think it's 27 degrees or something like that. Custer's last hit, uh, stand and Kiosk's last stand is only about 15, 20. Yeah. So it's a shallow hill, but, you know, uh, and it's more defensible. So you actually, and it's only a quarter of a mile. I, I mean, Josh, it, I know 2020 is hindsight, but if you can choose between a small copse of wood yeah. and a high ground, and you're about to be enveloped, Go to the it, high ground, and you're and you're mounted, does it, right? So yeah. it's uh, it's inexcusable, and uh, yeah. I'm a soldier, but even even a, a it's a it's literary man like me would know that you know you like <laughs> it. He he really does handle it really badly, and he gets cut to pieces for his trouble. Um, there's great, like you say, it's it's, it's there's great accounts from the suicide of just the rush of warriors trying to get out to fight and the bravest ones are up out already and and showing off and stuff and toying with the skirmish line so he has tons of time yes, crazy does. horse even does some pre-battle like ceremonies before he mounts up and rushes on and this <laughs> moment where um they find when when they know crazy horse is coming a big shout comes up crazy horse is coming crazy horse is coming hold kahe and everybody goes <laughs> Done your reading. Oh yeah. Now, meanwhile, as that's going down, Reno is contained. Right. As that that is going down, um, he's expecting Benteen to come. Um, he's expecting Benteen to come, and um, uh, join him right on the firing line, or or maybe he felt like. Ben Dean would come and, and, and save him from the... I just can't get over the idea why he went to those woods. I, so um, the, the people leaving the cops uh, uh, of woods uh, just north of what will become Reno you know, Hill, um, they still have a, a stream, and in some places it's, it's wide, shallow but wide at that point, to cross, you know? And, and it's at the bottom of the scully. So... You've got 250 uh, cavalry, dismounted cavalrymen, some are mounted, um, rushing up onto those hills. Some of their so, uh, the horses are shot from under them. And what happens is that a very, very brave cadre of, um, of soldiers put in, a, 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 essentially create a, 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 a fighting retreat, and they create a, a cordon in front of the stream where all the mounted men can can mar uh, gallop behind them or through them, and they're keeping off the by now seven hundred uh, 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 Sioux and 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 Arapaho and Cheyenne with repeating Winchesters, eighteen fifty, uh -huh. I'm sorry, eighteen sixty five and eighteen seventy three, <laughs> repeating rifles, and um, you know it's it's a it's a slaughter. They lose. Uh, about upwards of 150 men or something to that extent. Yeah, and it should be said that very few um, Sioux and Cheyenne accounts agree with each other as to like the specific timings of stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you read them, they are like visceral in terms of the descriptions of the battle. They've got well, a they guy. Don't have, they don't pay attention to chronology. They, no. they <laughs> by they I don't mean you know Native Americans. Yeah, yeah. Testimonies uh, uh, are linked to images. They yeah. they don't count you know what i mean Even when they're asked well how many were left and they always refer to well we don't know but it but the river was full of blood mm -hmm. at, at the shallow end do you understand so it's it's a re they react to the image i suppose if you're in a firefight you're not counting people anyway but no. but you know it's that cordon of those unnamed unrecognized uh cavalrymen 
who put up this fighting retreat. Those those are actual heroes. Whatever your oh yeah, you know your policy is. I don't believe they should have even been there, but but you have to agree that these are that those are fighting men, right? So what's left? The vestige of those three <clears throat> companies go up to the high ground. Uh, Benteen uh, uh, is witnessing the fight from atop the first butte, but he doesn't come down. He waits for he waits for uh, Marcus Reno to climb atop the high ground, and then he proceeds. Why doesn't he uh, attack when when he sees that? Um, that this terrible massacre is going on, for lack of a better word, this terrible rout is happening, is because there's a, there's a self-enlightened interest there uh, that he feels that if they're running for the high ground and there's that many braves, almost 700, he says in the account there's 2,000, which uh, in, in the proceedings of, of 1879, um, and that doesn't seem right, according, it doesn't really kind of add up. Mm -hmm. It's anywhere between 500 and 700 is, is what the accounts say when you put them all together. Um, and then he waits until the, the whatever, you know, could get up to the hill does so. When the Indians, when the, sorry, when the Sioux retreat to join the other forces that by now are amassing against Kiof and Custer, those two hills, that's when he goes down into the gully. And he quickly climbs up. And all of a sudden, now Marco Reno, who's you know, half company size or company size, is now buttressed by three more companies. And you gotta remember that there's there's another, there's the pack train coming with one company. If you remember a company H that's coming in. So what you have is now a viable force and the high ground that with the supplies coming in, that they could stay you know, a number of days give, if they give a spirit of defense. And in fact, they do. Meanwhile, Custer and his four companies are trying to find a way to ford the, uh, the Little Bighorn River and to you know, flank behind the Indian village, capture the women and children to use as, as currency for their survival. But he, he keeps seeing no end to the village. And also when he tries to ford at one, you know, he sees that, that he's got to keep going to the end. So what does he do? He asks Kioff and Calhoun to, to try to ford this entrance to the river whilst he goes further north. So thinking a double flanking, so you he know. splits his force again. In the face of the enemy now. Yeah, in the face of the enemy. And, and I guess it's, it, given that position, it's sound. Yeah. He shouldn't have been in that position, but you know, hindsight's going twenty. Uh, he often Calhoun are are, uh, are disallowed. There's too many people firing against them. By now, it's it's a well trained militia, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they can't they can't ford the uh, the river in the middle of the of the village uh, because they're fought off, and then they retire up to some higher ground. Meanwhile, Custer comes down to the river's edge, just north of the river, but. He, he begins to see the, the pony herds, and he thinks, well, we're here, right? But the women and children by then have had enough time to cloister themselves even farther north of the pony herd, and they're completely inaccessible. Mm -hmm. He's being attacked by crazy folks. Mm -hmm. and, and Gaul and Two Moon, Two all moon. of these big guys. Yeah, they, what they do is they, they do their own enveloped movement. They bifurcate their envelopment. So can one, imagine from like three sides or something like that. And I mean, I mean, that's that complexity. That that takes training. That takes time. That takes. You know time. what they also do is they get the high ground. Mm -hmm. Custer Hill is overlooked by other other small depressions. Yeah, but but they're not. The, 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 you're right. You're right. But they're not within range of the Winchester, which is 200 yards. No, they have to get quite close to, to, get close to use to. them, which right. suits which suits their way of fighting. They like to get close. Yeah, and get close. Absolutely. I mean, it's just a generation before them. They didn't have repeating rifles. They yeah. Had <laughs> if that, right? Yeah. So, um, so both the hills are are uh, are enveloped. Kiof, uh, just southwest of Custer Hills. These are very shallow hills, as, as you've said. Um, Kiof and and Calhoun are dispatched within 20 minutes of having tried to ford the river. 
uh, Custer's uh, uh, fight is just, it's almost, it seems almost punctuary, it's, it's done. It, and, and the whole action, give you an idea, the entire action, including Marco, Marco Reno's, Marcus Reno's first attack, then team going up, all this, everything that we've described right now is described, as you well know, uh, as the same time it takes a hungry man to finish his lunch. Yeah. So I, I, I've read another one that a, a boy came up to give his horse, a, warrior, a young warrior came up, he had three horses, and he reached the, the bit where Reno had, had initiated the fight, and he had got himself ready, and he had brought his horses forward to mount up and fight, and he said, I'm, I'm ready to fight, and this other guy said, well, it's over. <laughs> Over. Yes, it's over. By the time so, he was ready, it was over. What would that be like? It just over. Well, we don't know. We'll never know because the we. But there is some estimates, and I I have a study. There's one. It's actually a really good study on YouTube. Um, that it's about an hour and a half. Yeah, or ninety minutes. Now, there um there are many different. There's a there's a wonderful uh, book called Who Killed Custer. Yeah, uh, because there are, there are four or five or six testimonies of people who claim that um, yes, he was shot first in the breast, but I gave him his coup de gras. Uh, uh, I think it's Buckle Kaplan who says that I I I I, I clubbed him with a stone axe and he went down. Um, you know, uh, they, they, you're dealing with an oral tradition in and of itself. But what happens is that all of those braves, all, all of the Sioux warriors that dispatched Keoff, Calhoun, and Custer were now amassing to the, what becomes a siege of Reno Hill, yeah. right? And to the credit of the four or, you know, or five decimated companies, they fight for two nights, two entire nights. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and and by then, uh, the the like you said before, there there wasn't enough grazing. Uh, the 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 uh, Native Americans of Sioux were running out of food. Uh, they hadn't gotten a chance to preserve their salt their meats. They couldn't stay there and put up battle. So they knew they were going to leave. And of course, what they do is they they create a, a like a buffer area of a burning bush so that. Those on the hill couldn't see them as they walked parallel. The whole entire, imagine, 8,000, anywhere between 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 people now. Not warriors now, they're people. Oh, yeah. after, after two days or three days, three days of fighting, two nights, just walking on mass. You know, and they can make out, they can make out that these people are migrating. But what a lesson. Mm -hmm. What a lesson to see all of those who congregated as a people walking past them, you know, like the people in the, in the Sinai desert. I mean, we're talking old Testament here, you know, we're yeah. talking the beginnings of nations, the survival of nations, the children in the Sinai. I mean, all of those thoughts must have come into their hands, you know, into, into their hands, into yeah. their, 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 into their eyes and into their brains and into their cultural tradition. And they yeah. must question what the hell are we doing here? Especially the immigrants who didn't yeah. walk it. They were too fresh off the boat to buy into the manifest destiny idea. You know, they didn't have that, that cultural meme in their bones yet. Uh -huh. uh, so they must have felt we will never know. But I've never come across, perhaps it was censured, I've never come across that, that, that shade, let's say, of guilt to consciousness. Of, uh -huh. of, are we on our, what's going on here? Who are we? Are, are we the are we the Egyptians trying to kill uh -huh. you know, the Israelites? Um, it must have, have somehow appealed to their to their uh, cultural, original, yeah. cultural cultural And then, of course, one day later, um, in comes uh, Terry, who's coming down with Gibbon, and the idea was, you know, to come down the little big horn. They, they knew in the general area uh, the powder horn or the little big. I'm sorry. How we grow the, the Little Bighorn Valleys? They knew the, the, the Sioux were congregated there. The idea was to Cork to, and Custer to come up from the south and Terry and Gibbon to come from the north, and then they would just pocket them. The idea was we must capture them or else, as with the Cheyenne War, you know, these people know how to fight on their feet, on their, on their hoofs. 
this is going to last a long time. So we need to have, in the Western sense, we need to have a defining battle of conquest. Well, the Sioux uh, uh, won this particular battle, but what was supposed to be a, a short, splendid little campaign ended up being about uh, 12 years of occupation. And they were in the terrible slaughter of the Sioux in the, um, during the, the ghost dance. Um, in 1890, um, and it's uh, it's 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 the beginning of the American Empire. Uh -huh. You know, um, the Civil War has just happened. Uh, I can I don't agree with this, but I can understand why a, 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 a Republican, that is someone who had fought hard to free the slaves, we have freedmen, we have we have. Um, we have people coming from abroad uh, to jumpstart this economy, this, this, this society. You know, we have to rise ourselves from the ashes. We have to reconstruct the South. We need more labor. We're, we're, we're expanding the railroads. Um, we're becoming a pluribus unum. Uh, from their point of view, the, the Sioux uprising, the Sioux revolution, is nothing other than a bunch of ragamuffin, you know, uh, banditti that are trying to ruin our plan of making this continent one whole Republican empire. You mm. know? So from his point of view, I shouldn't use empire, I'll just say probably this whole Republican continent. From their yeah. point of view, they were the apex of humanity. Uh, it's funny because they were <laughs> solidly imperialist, but of course they called themselves anti-imperialists, they were Republicans. So uh, the what's what what ensues is a is a two year two and a half year campaign through the winter and through all seasons uh, to destroy the Sioux. The Sioux are decimated. Crazy horses taken in prison. He's killed. While he uses in irons through a, a tawdry fight with his guard, um, Sitting Bull, two moons it, uh, 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 gives himself up, becomes a leader of the Sioux Reservation. Uh, and Sitting Bull goes up to the grandmother's land, Victoria, mm -hmm. Canada, what the Sioux used to call Canada. And he's an exile, he's a political exile, for all intents and purposes, for three years. Uh, the friends, uh, Canadian Mounties, and then at the end it just became, you know, un unbrookable for, for Canada to, to um, just politically to hold on to Sitting Bull by then, the, the biggest... Um, Revolutionary, you know, the Pancho Villa yeah. of, of the North, right? uh, and he's and he's he's um, he's forced out of Canada, and then he willfully uh, walks into the Laramie uh, Reservation. I believe it's the Laramie Reservation. He hands his Winchester rifle, his 1856 talisman, right, um, with his eagle feather, and he says, "I'm giving this to you." as a sign of peace. No longer will we make war. So that, that gesture of literally burying, well, figuratively, but, but all, you know, burying the hatchet or burying the Winchester in this case, um, results in, in a, a late career um, 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 success with Buffalo Bill for about two and a half years. He becomes the Indian du jour, and he's quoted in, in all the presses of the world. He, Never leaves the United States, uh, but certainly Buffalo Bill's rodeo show goes all over the place. Kaiser saw it. Victoria uh, had a command performance. He plays. Um, Napoleon the Third is gone, but he, he plays for the third for the Third Republic. Buffalo Bill. Uh, he goes all over the world, and and that's the dissemination of the Western. Uh -huh. um, I just heard uh, a wonderful. book. I love uh, the rest of history. As well as we have ways, and um, and they just did something on the West Night. I, I thought it, it was fabulous the way that um, that the the it, it the Western myth was such that Hitler used to watch movies. Hitler used to watch Tom Mix films, and, and I may have seen a couple of Ford films. I don't know, Stagecoach, possibly. But uh, I mean, that says it all, right? That says it all. Yeah, it does. And for now, I think we have more than more than exhausted our time. 
Uh, and get to work. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so thank you so much, Chaz, for uh, for coming on the show again and talking to me about uh, about Castor and Little Bighorn and and this this fascinating subject. Well, Looking I, forward. I, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Go on. Go on. No, I, I was just going to say I'm. You know, mild book plug. I'm, I'm looking forward to to seeing to seeing your book when it gets published. Thank you so much, too, Stud. Um, I'd like to close with with the following. Um, after Lincoln, the most uh, the most popular uh, uh, figure written about. I mean, in book in, in long form in books. And the, the person after Lincoln who is most written about is George Armstrong Custer and the Little Bighorn. So it's a 90 minute battle that has a lot of what ifs, has a lot of contenders. It's actually a hornet's nest of uh, vagaries and contending forces. And, it's, and then when you throw politics on top of that, it's very factious, mm -hmm. you know? So I was warned before I went into these studies, I mean, you know, you really have to rely on your own take because there's just too much out there. It's a mythologized battle that needs to be um, revisited by people. And I hope someday put to rest, but I, I doubt it. I doubt it. Um, you know, um, especially given the, the lack of historical uh, academic tradition in American um, education. It's, it's always going to be unfortunate. It's always going to be a reliable and opportune figure to be used by the more darker forces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so with, with that, with that thought that 90 minutes of, uh, brutal death can... Are longer than the battle. <laughs> exactly. People, <laughs> if you have reached the end of this, uh, talk, the battle is over, right? <laughs> Reno and Benteen, it's their show now, up on the hill. Oh, 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 uh, who died with Custer? 29 Irishmen, 15 Englishmen and Scots. And, and, and Scotch. We don't know if they were, we don't know the exact, because, you know, it, it was, it was uh -huh. you know, and they all had the same passport, but, but uh, 15 Britishers, right, uh, died along with Custer, two Spanish, and here's my big discovery. One of the two Spaniards that fought with Custer and died, one of them, one was born in Iberia, in Spain, uh, and came to Cuba, and then from Cuba immigrated to the United States, Havana being in Port of Call and in the Spanish Empire at that time. One of them was born in Cuba, in Havana. So of course he had a Spanish passport and, and because he, Cuba was part of the Spanish empire, the corrupted empire at the time. So I have never come across this uh, in, in my studies. I'm sure it's gotta be somewhere, but along with Custer, one Cuban man was present and died. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm a first generation American. My parents were Cubans. So if my dad were alive, he'd, he'd pat me on the back of my head and, and say yeah. you're embarrassing us by saying that the Cuban fault of Cuba. There you are. And now, and now, many years later, the descendants of a uh, Cuban immigrant <laughs> is writing about it. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I thank you so much for, for this time. I, you're wonderful, and what you do is terrific. And 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 you are you're uh, uh, an upcoming talent. And I look forward to reading all the books that you're writing. You're um, you you're the stuff, man. Look forward uh, to it. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, same back to you. I, I really uh, enjoy everything that you you put online, and um, re I'm legitimately looking forward to to this book. Thank so, you. ladies and gentlemen, pertinent um, links will be found below. Um, thank you to Chaz. Thank you to all of you for watching. Um, as as usual, I'm just going to wrap up by encouraging you all to have courage and have compassion. Godspeed. Go do what you have to do. Uh, and uh, thanks once more to Jasmine. Jasmine, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Cheers.